Welcome everybody to the ECR Western Balkan Summit, a conference that brings together experts in the field of European integration, as well as decision makers from the Western Balkans and several MEPs from the ECR group. In our discussion today, we will focus mainly on the current challenges in the region. In particular, we will focus on foreign interference and disinformation. Tomorrow, we will continue our discussion with the opportunities the European enlargement process uh, can offer to address the challenges in the region. The Western Balkans are part of Europe. Still, to become a member of the European Union community, the Western Balkan countries must free themselves from uh, the dependencies they had in the past. They also must undertake many reforms. On the other hand, the European Union must, must consider the specifics of the region, including the influence the third countries have uh, in this area, and the European Union can propose solutions. At the crossroad of Europe, the Western Balkans are exposed uh, to influence of autocratic powers such as Russia, China and others, who use proxies in the region to promote their own their own interests. This is an, an obstacle to the integration of the region to the European Union. Any attempt to politically destabilize the region is a threat uh, to the security not only of the Western Balkan countries, but it can also have impact on the whole European Union. I'm Milena Milutinova, host of Brussels One TV show on Bulgaria on, on Air TV and I will moderate this event. We start in a minute, so don't go away. We are coming back in actually 20 seconds with our guests. Our first Our first speakers today are Professor Zdzisław Krastodełbski, Chairman of the ECR Working Group on uh, Institutional Reform, but also ECR Shadow Rapporteur on Serbia and Montenegro, and uh, Mr. Angel Jambaski, Chairman of the ECR Working Group on Western Balkans, and ECR Shadow Rapporteur on North Macedonia and Kosovo. Both of them are in studio. Welcome, gentlemen. And uh, we have uh, remotely the ECR Group Co-Chairman, Mr. Raffaele Fitu, who is also the ECR Group Shadow Rapporteur on Albania. So, Mr. Fito, you have Good the floor. Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the ECR Western Balkan Summit. Europe has a civilizational choice. This event is part of a series of initiatives for which I would like to thank Professor Krasnodesky. Through these initiatives, our group wants to highlight the need for the EU to cooperate more closely with the countries of Eastern and Western neighborhood. Europe has historically turned its attention to the area, especially during crisis, without realizing, however, that dealing with the accession of those countries should have been a natural step to complete the Union not just because of their geographical belonging to our continent, but also because of historical and cultural factors. Today, we need to strengthen these relations even more for a number of reasons. First of all, in light of the Russian-Ukrainian crisis, there are strong geopolitical reasons. The attempts by foreign players to interfere in the economic, commercial and the political fabric of these states. Undermining their integration and the political stability are evident. We must also consider the economic aspects, because the Union and its member states are the main partners of the Western Balkans in terms of trade and investments. It is also worth noting that China is making inroads into the region through loans and the financing of infrastructure projects, especially in the transport and energy sectors. 
What is needed, therefore, is a strategy to give a new European perspective to these countries, giving a new life to the enlargement and accession process and overcoming the political and diplomatic uncertainties that have so far characterized it, working closely and as equally as possible with all the countries in the region would also mean creating new conditions for stability, preventing new crises in our continent and addressing future challenges such as defense and security and the fight against terrorism and organized crime. I hope that this event will be an opportunity to reflect and strengthen the friendship and the cooperation between our peoples. Also because thousands of citizens, young people and businesses from both sides now invest, work and study across the two sides of Adriatic, making the EU a reference point for the whole of Southeastern Europe. Thank you. Many thanks to Mr. Fito for uh, his support to this initiative. And uh, going back to our uh, two MEPs in the studio, Professor Zdzislav Krasnodelski, Chairman of the ECR Working Group on Institutional Re Reform, and also Shadow Rapporteur on Serbia and Montenegro, and Mr. Angel Jambaski, Chairman of the ECR Working Group on uh, the Western Balkans, and uh, Shadow Rapporteur on North Macedonia and Kosovo. Uh, to you, Professor Krasnodelski, uh, would you tell us, please, uh, what are the efforts of the ECR group on uh, proposing the alternative to the Conference on, on the Future of Europe? Yeah, th th thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. And uh, I'm convinced that uh, I'm sure that the people who uh, are watching us today uh, are already familiar with our vision of the future of Europe. Uh, thanks, among other, to this uh, campaign we organize uh, under the title Europe's Future A New Hope. Um, uh, this was a series of the video conferences uh, in the last, uh, uh, last year in the many of uh, European capitals, Warsaw, Stockholm, Madrid, The Hague, Sofia, Bucharest, and we discussed the, the reform of the, of the EU in this hybrid e events. Uh, just to re remind you of a watchword, uh, the secure borders serve citizens, sovereign member states, realistic climate protection, doing less, doing better. And uh, we are also always convinced and we stress that um, Europe is not only limited to, to the EU. The EU is the uh, current form, political form of the, of, the, of, of the Europe, of the part of Europe, maybe majority of Europe, but there is an old synonymous, uh, synonymously term, Europe and the EU. And now we will see how the uh, war, this brutal war in Ukraine changed the situation. Because uh, today probably we have uh, to say that uh, the future of Europe um, will be uh, influenced more by this war than by our discussion sometimes uh, here in the European Parliament. So when we started in the, in the um, beginning of March, in the first week of the war, we organized um, um, the first Eastern uh, Partnership su Summit of the ECR group. We had then opportunity to discuss the, what, is, uh, uh, what are the circumstances, what are the events, what this, mean, uh, was, what this war means for the, for the future of Europe and also for our countries. Mm, but the same importance has also uh, South Southeast neighborhood. Uh, uh, the Western ba Balkans is a subject to the growing pressure for foreign powers. Uh, mm, uh, and in the current situation caused by Russian aggression in the Ukraine, they will be probably a big changes also in the relation of this, uh, these countries to the European Union. And this is what we would like to discuss in, the, in this next day, today and tomorrow with our MEPs, uh, with uh, experts, with experienced decision makers. Uh, and we will talk about future development in Serbia, Montenegro, Albania, North Macedonia, Bosnia, Herzegovina and Kosovo. Uh, we have, uh, as was already mentioned, two panel discussion. The first one 
focused on the current challenges faced by Western Balkan countries, in particular disinformation and foreign interference. And the second panel will address a broad questions of how the accession uh, process can help to fight against these problems. And uh, we, as a, a political group, we treat um, uh, this conference, this whole debate about future of Europe very seriously. Um, but we would like also to propose our vision, which is uh, not uh, unrealistic utopia, but uh, is based on the effects of geopolitical situation of Europe and all, also have acknowledged the fact that uh, Europe is to consist of the 27 uh, uh, sovereign member states, uh, uh, which uh, of course uh, sometimes and in many times uh, act together uh, in solidarity as it uh, now is. But we oppose very strong to federalist dogma that ever closer union is the only, mm, only mm, process which uh, on the other hand can only lead to the, to, to, to the European Federation. So now we would uh, want to, we would like to, want, uh, to share this vision with our partners in the Western Balkans to hear what the perspective of European Union are what the, are the opinions about future of Union. So please stay with us. Thank you, Professor. Uh, Mr. Jambaski, would you tell us please uh, uh, what is the ECR position on the enlargement process towards the Western Balkans and uh, uh, what are the activities of uh, the working group on uh, the Western Balkans so far? Thank you for this question. And I want to thank also to Mr. Krasnodevsky um, for uh, uh, this event. Well, um, the six countries which uh, we uh, usually uh, refer to as the Western Balkans, they are uh, Albania, Bosnia, Montenegro, North Macedonia and Serbia, are widely acknowledged uh, as the next prospective members of European Union. Uh, this is understandable. This, they are part of uh, our continent and this region is very important because of the history and geopolitically. So, uh, it, this part of our continent uh, uh, is important for us and it, it, it is uh, important for us not to lose our uh, focus and our influence in, in, uh, in this region. Uh, all these countries of Western Balkans have to have a credible path to the, Euro to the, to the European Union. Uh, this year group position, and especially the position of our working group, is that we support the accession process, but not at all costs, because there are some things to discuss. And I believe in our uh, next uh, uh, Q&A, we will focus on them. Um, well, countries uh, uh, um, are uh, ready to become members of European Union, but they need to know uh, that joining this club comes with uh, a lot of uh, responsibilities and requirements. And the start of the negotiation process uh, will happen after all bilateral issues closed and when all, for example, Copenhagen criteria are fulfilled properly. Including the human rights. Yes, of course, especially the human rights, because when we are discussing human rights, this is not a bilateral issue. This is Copenhagen criteria established in 1993, if, if I'm not wrong, um, just before the, 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 the first uh, big enlargement process with the countries uh, from the Central and uh, Eastern Europe, uh, in order to, to establish a common, a common way and common standard of protection of human rights, minority rights, etc., etc. So, uh, the, uh, the countries for the Western Balkans should be ready and should be fulfilled fully and not doubly these criteria uh, before the start of these uh, processes for all of them. Uh, they, they, they are obliged to, to cover fully these criteria. Well, uh, uh -huh. There are a lot of um, internal issues in the Union already, uh, so we can't uh, allow another 
uh, un, un, unclosed uh, questions to be part of the internal um, process and, and internal politics of European Union. And I can here fully support Professor Krasnodevsky. Um, for us, it is clear and we'll do our best to make it clear uh, when we are um, negotiating and uh, discussing with our colleagues uh, from Western Balkan countries uh, that the Federalist agenda is not the only agenda and uh, it's not the way uh, to uh, up uh, upgrade the Union uh, leading him from Brussels to uh, to some kind of bureaucratic nowhere. Uh, so um, in this process, we will do our best, and we are doing our best uh, to present properly and clearly ECR group position. And this is for now. Okay, uh, as a shadow rapporteur on uh, North Macedonia and Kosovo, uh, what are uh, the main challenges uh, that uh, these two countries are facing, and uh, what are uh, the steps uh, uh, for the Republic of uh, North Macedonia? Uh, what steps uh, uh, has North Macedonia to do uh, to start the negotiation process? Well, both of these countries, uh, North Macedonia and Kosovo, are very clear sample that the region uh, has uh, its differences. And uh, um, countries are different. For example, Kosovo. Kosovo is maybe the main, the, uh, the okay, uh, the country which is mostly pro-Western, pro-Europe. So Kosovo, from my point of view, uh, is treated in some way unfairly. Uh, they cover fully all the criteria for visa liberalization, but this is still not happening. Uh, so uh, people in Kosovo are a little bit disappointed because they have covered every criteria, such as, as Romania and uh, uh, Croatia regarding the Schengen uh, area. But still, due to internal political uh, uh, battles in parts of the countries. Uh, Bulgaria, um, Romania and Croatia are not a part of Schengen and Kosovo is still uh, without uh, uh, visa liberalization. Uh, they, people in Kosovo, they made their choices. They, uh, 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 the last elections, they, they, they show uh, will, political will uh, to fight corruption, uh, to reform uh, their judicial system, uh, to to fulfill every single criteria we ask them. But they're still waiting. There are still countries uh, uh, on standby uh, when we are talking about the recognition of Kosovo as an independent state. Uh, so there uh, are a lot of promises made and not uh, answered. Uh, the situation in the North Macedonia is totally different because uh, yes, the, the way the political way of North Macedonia is to be part of European Union, no doubt. But still, uh, they have to fight uh, a lot of issues in their internal politics. For example, uh, hate speech against the neighbors. For example, a lot of questions about the human rights in the country. Let me once again remind that this is not a bilateral issue. This is a, a, a European one. A European one, of course, fully European one. Uh, they still have to implement, uh, for example, uh, bilateral um, treaties fully and work and uh, uh, execute this, uh, these treaties. Treaty with Greece, treaty with, uh, with Bulgaria, they're still uh, on standby. Should, so, this, uh, should these treaties uh, become a part of uh, the negotiation fr framework for uh, North Macedonia? Uh, uh, my, well, on my opinion, they should be. They should be because uh, uh, this will uh, make this process uh, uh, open, clear, very visible, and uh, uh, there will be um, a lot of... Uh, uh, okay, uh, both authorities in, uh, in Skopje and in Brussels, they will know that these uh, uh, treaties should be executed as part of a uh, future negotiating process. So 
it should be. Should the execution of these treaties, uh, should it be under uh, the control of the European institutions? Mm, absolutely. Also? Absolutely, because uh, uh, there, this is the only guarantee that uh, something will happen. There are a lot of uh, um, political projects on the Balkans um, under the foreign influence or clear proxies, and they are uh, very visibly proxies of uh, Russia, uh, which will do their best to uh, to blow up the process or to stop process or to create some uh, commotions within the, the inside the process. Uh, so this kind of guarantee is more than necessary. Okay, thank you, Mr. Jambaski. Uh, Professor Krasnodebski, uh, as a shadow rapporteur on Serbia and Montenegro, uh, what are the main challenges uh, these two countries are facing? Yeah, the very in difficult in different situation concerning uh, the um, progress toward uh, the EU. Uh, but uh, I just wanted uh, first to mention this, you know, how important this whole the region Balkans are for, for Europe. Uh, because we shouldn't forget that the, at the beginning of the 20th century, the war in Balkans changed everything in Europe. This is uh, like we can compare this uh, probably we do not know what would be the consequences but we, we compare this uh, with the war in the ukraine and on the on the eastern border of, of the eu and we will see now that, that there is a, there was a promise uh, that uh, uh, with the european integration the danger of war will disappear from europe we see that it's not the case and uh, just remembered also that the, at the beginning of the transformation of the Europe in, in, in the early 90s, there was a war in the ba Balkans. So we have uh, in this country, what my colleague also mentioned, on one hand, uh, big progress and there's a striving from the, towards the EU. On the other side, there are still ethnic tension. They are everywhere, there are problems with, uh, with political systems, with, uh, with corruption. Uh, with some mm, yeah, national tendency, I would say it's uh, still the region which uh, is uh, influenced by this tra traumatic experience of the war in the early 90s. Uh, but Montenegro, Montenegro is uh, uh, considered to be a success from the Union. It is very, very close to the, to, to the Union, to the Europe. It's also a member of, of, of NATO. It's, uh, taking part in the, in the um, common uh, security and defense policy. And um, so generally, I would say, if because we as ECR group, we support the extension of the, of the Union, enlargement of the Union, um, both to the east and to the, to, 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 to the south. south, yeah. And, uh, but uh, in uh, Serbian, I think in Serbia it is much more difficult and also with Serbian population um, in uh, other countries than, 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 than Serbia. But we will see, because I think that this, um, this war, uh, this Russian aggression changed the attitude to Russia in whole of Europe, not only in the Balkans, but also in Germany. In uh, France, there was a big illusion what, that Russia is a kind of alternative to, to the EU. And I think that uh, many people who probably invest this false hope in, uh, in Russia also believed in some information from Russia, they probably will change uh, the position. And this can also influence a, a political process, a political process, let's say process of Europeanization. But this is last sentence, but we have also as a DU to rethink, yeah, rethink our position and what actually we demand from, from this uh, country or to open up the perspective, but maybe also to be a, a little modest, you know, in this, uh, uh, what, uh, in this processes of federalization, centralization and impose some cultural models, which actually not uh, really, uh, I'd say, uh, valuable. Yeah. 
and at instead insist of some fundamental human rights, of some, some fundamental democratic institution, division of power, rule of law, but proper understood and not used, you know, to, to impose the po political pressure and so. And for this reason, I would say, our vision of, of, of Europe, it is the best way to integrate uh, uh, Ukraine, Georgia, our Eastern partnership countries, but also, but also this Balkans uh, countries. Can we go some more in details about uh, Serbia? Uh, because we are talking today uh, about the foreign interference uh, in, in the Western Balkans. And we all know the close connections between uh, Moscow and Belgrade. Uh, and uh, Moscow is uh, executing uh, pressure uh, in the region through Belgrade. Uh, on, on the 4th of March, in the beginning of March, there was a demonstration in Belgrade uh, supporting Russia and uh, the invasion in Ukraine. Uh, Serbia also refuses uh, to join the European Union sanctions against Russia. So, um, what is your comment on, on that? And uh, shouldn't Serbia align uh, its foreign policy uh, to the uh, European uh, Union's policy uh, if it wants uh, to become a member of the European Union? Uh, yes, uh, of course, uh, I would say you, 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 you are right yeah, that this, this uh, close ties of Belgrade to Moscow, they are, uh, what we should uh, criticize, the sanction, lack of the sanction and also this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, yeah, popular attitude. But uh, on the other hand, if we consider how reluctant was Germany to impose the sanction on, on, on Russia, how uh, close are ties of the French business still with, uh, there are some companies, French companies, which didn't withdraw from, uh, from, uh, fr fr from Russia. And on the other hand, we have a very, uh, as a country which is traumatized by, by, by the war. We know who, that uh, it was a Serbia which actually was the, 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 the main opponent in the you, you know in this war in this and this is very very difficult process we can also study this on, on the, the, the other uh, uh, ca historical cases so I would say we have to 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 propose on Serbian people to talk to engage them and to say to to, to to convince them that Russia is not a solution, that the Russia is not an attractive proposal, that uh, uh, we can together uh, uh, to achieve much more for Serbia and for Europe than, uh, you, you, you know, uh, this kind of looking at, at Russia on China, because we are now talking about Russia, but also China influences in this region are, are very, very dangerous. So not to to easily condemn Serbian people, but, but try to, to convince them that it is not the, 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 the pro, pro, proper way, that it is not good for also from, from, from Serbia. And that, that in this way we can achieve peace and, uh, and, 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 and cooperation in all the region, I, I, I hope. And for this, for this, for this aim, we need in Europe more stronger voice of a conservative like uh, like uh, ECR voice uh, in, in, in the EU in order to achieve this, this kind of integration, which would be, uh, as I said, positive for both sides. Mr. Jabaski, uh, what is uh, your opinion on, on that? Are there uh, uh, close connections, the same close connections between uh, North Macedonia and Russia? Of course there are, uh, because uh, most of the political parties in the Republic of Northern, what, North Macedonia and most of the so-called media, they are not media, they are just uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, propaganda organizations. Uh, most of them are not just connected with Belgrade and Moscow, they are funded from there and they are backed and uh, supported uh, on, uh, on, on, on this line. Uh, let me give you very, very clear and very simple example. Um, Putin's party in Russia, uh, in Russia uh, is called uh, United Russia, Edina Russia. And they have a bear with the Russian flag as a symbol. The same political party 
was created in Macedonia, North Macedonia, named United North Macedonia, with the same bear and the same way of uh, waving the flag. Uh, so all these people, you can see them in front of the uh, Russian embassy to support uh, this criminal war against Ukraine. And you can see them against the other embassies uh, to protest against the sanctions of European Union against, um, against this war. So it means that the fifth column of uh, Russia and Serbia in, uh, in Skopje uh, is forming and creating um, the whole proxy uh, propaganda media political system uh, in order to create a fourth post, in order to use all the uh, old ties um, um, based on a cooperation between the secret services of, of former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. Um, this is uh, KGB, of course, and OSNA. This means, uh, this is the acronym of the uh, totalitarian Serbian um, secret service forces. And they're using these people still uh, to create um, tensions in the in Macedonian whole, whole region. Uh, they are the most active fake propaganda news uh, for example, the city of uh, um, Veles is well known as the, the place, the, the fortress of fake news factories in uh, Europe. A, a huge number of fake profiles are creating every day fake news regarding the war, trying to explain how this is not a war but a special operation, um, blaming Ukraine for the war, etc., etc., etc. So, uh, a number of people, uh, experts in, in the region, uh, they, they think, and I can agree with them, uh, that uh, at, at some point, maybe, uh, the government in Kremlin will decide uh, to diverse, to split the, the war and to took the attention from the Ukraine and place this attention uh, somewhere else. It is quite possible uh, for them to try to uh, to do something in Bosnia Herzegovina or Kosovo, uh, to create some tensions, some clashes, something like they they already tried something in the beginning of the the year uh, with um, Serbian organized protest of uh, um, Serbian originals from Kosovo because of the number plates of the cars. Uh, so they've already prepared the, the, the soil for something like this. Uh, if you follow the news from Serbia, maybe you will notice that um, right now they are doing some military exercises and they are replacing part of their uh, military equipment and, to uh, and personnel to Kosovo. Uh, so maybe something is going to happen in this region and they will use uh, their uh, their uh, network in northern Macedonia, in Serbia, in these uh, six uh, communities in uh, um, in uh, in Kosovo, um, where is located so-called Serbska Stranka coalition, uh, town of Leposavic, the, uh, North Mitrovica or Kosovska Mitrovica, and um, some other. Um, communities. So uh, there are connections and these connections are not for good. Uh, these connections are not in favor of uh, any European way, any, and uh, they work very strictly under the orders of Kremlin, translated uh, by, by Belgrade uh, uh, for their own purposes. Mr. Jambaski, Professor Krasnodebski, uh, thank you very much uh, for your answers. Uh, uh, this discussion will resume shortly after the video. Stay with us for the rest of the program. Sin fe, no habría Europa. 
La liberté est le fondement de l'Europe. Respect für das gemeinsame Erbe. Tradition binds our continent. Non c'è valore più importante della famiglia. Europa ist dobrem wspólnym. Różnimy się, ale powinno nas łączyć wspólne dziedzictwo. Powróćmy do Unii Europejskiej, która z tego dziedzictwa wyrasta i która szanuje narodowe tożsamości. Only the European Union without arrogance, based on solidarity and mutual respect for its member states, can regain the support of the European nations. We can do it together. The topic of uh, our first panel discussion is uh, foreign interference and uh, disinformation in the Western Balkans. At the geographic and the political crossroad of uh, Europe, the Western Balkans are uh, at risk of hostile influence of autocratic powers such as Russia, China, Iran and some others. The region is also prone to foreign disinformation campaigns as well as uh, some more explicit acts of political pressure from outside Europe. These acts uh, aim to undermine the security in the region and above. Any attempt to politically destabilize the region constitutes a threat not only to the security of the Western Balkan countries but also uh, to the security of the whole European Union. This panel will, will be divided into two sections, uh, an introductory exchange of views uh, with the participants uh, of a special guest and a longer discussion between experts uh, and ECR MEPs. And let me once again introduce Mr. Angel Jambaski, uh, MEP from the ECR group, and our guest uh, uh, Zorka Kordic, chief negotiator for the European Union accession of uh, Montenegro, who is with us remotely. Now, uh, Ms. Kordic, uh, uh, would you give us uh, your opening remarks on the state of play of uh, the Montenegro's uh, European Union accession negotiation and uh, where do you face the greatest uh, difficulties in the negotiation process? First of all, uh, good day from Podgorica to the kindest auditorium of yours and uh, a big thank you for this uh, very positive initiative that actually uh, came from, uh, pro from uh, pro Professor Krasnodepsky, which I wanted to uh, use as also uh, the contribution of Montenegro uh, in the widest sense uh, to the Conference on the Future of Europe, because it's always important uh, to uh, use the opportunity to share our vision of how we see uh, our future in the European Union, given that we have been the candidate country since 2012. Uh, what is the key uh, element in our uh, uh, EU negotiations is, and this is why I always use this occasion to talk to you as European citizens to explain to the citizens of the of the EU and decision makers of the EU member states is why this process, EU integration process, is so relevant for uh, Montenegro for all our Western Balkan countries. It is because of its transformative power and the changes it has been triggering over the, the years, in particular when it comes to the rule of law reform. And uh, why this is fundamentally important for our country and for our citizens is, uh, in, uh, in my opinion, it is embedded in one strong messages, message coming from our citizens who, uh, at the percentage of of an average 75% support EU membership of, uh, of Montenegro. And if there would be um, an, a referendum um, 
on the on the EU membership, the the the, the surveys not only from this year but the couple of years, the, in the last couple of years, in continuation, say that more than eighty five percent of our citizens would vote yes. So this is a key message for our decision makers, for our politicians, why it is so uh, important, because it's the essential message also to our politicians, because at this at this specific uh, phase of negotiations, Montenegro, as the most advanced candidate country, we opened all the EU key chapters, and uh, we have been uh, very much uh, focused on keeping the constant and continuous 100% alignment on the common foreign and security policy of the EU. So the key, basically the key uh, pillars and the key elements of our EU negotiating process since the 2012 have been full alignment with the common foreign and security policy, meaning also full alignment with a system of EU core values. And this is something that is reflected in our second out of three priorities, rule of law reform, which is the, 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 the driving uh, force of, of, of this process. And of course, the third very important element is also to keep up with the economic criteria and with the standards in sectoral policies that uh, that come with the, the alignment with the EU key in all of the 33 chapters. So basically, Montenegro is now uh, approaching the final phase of the the uh, EU accession negotiations. So uh, in front of us, there are important uh, challenges, important in terms of uh, its value also for our society. So further rule of law reform, uh, further depolitization when it, when it comes to the influence of politics to the judiciary. So now reform of the judiciary is key. We are in this phase uh, where the the, the debate, the so social debate on uh, rule of law will actually influence also the political landscape in uh, Montenegro. It is important to understand uh, for the overall uh, state of play and for the overall process that uh, basically uh, we had in, tw uh, in summer 2020, after almost three decades of one party ruling and governing the, the processes, this uh, uh, change, uh, democratic change of uh, government, which, which resulted in uh, the establishment of the new government based on the expert concept that during the 2021 uh, further uh, continued on these three key pillars when it comes to the EU negotiations. So again, common foreign and security policy alignment, uh, rule of law reform with strong focus on fight against organized crime and corruption, and of course, a lot of efforts in the area of economic criteria. However, in February this year, uh, this uh, government as of uh, mid-February uh, is has been working in its technical mandate. While in the society there is uh, an overall debate on how to further proceed the EU, the EU uh, path. So in Montenegrin society, EU accession is a top uh, societal issue and a top political issue. Uh, as for this specific topic of the today's uh, panel, we have been analyzed in how we can make most of the new, of the context of the so-called revised EU accession methodology that uh, basically uh, might provide some more tools and instruments for a stronger uh, uh, integration and maybe allow uh, to Montenegro or other candidate countries also to, to participate in some uh, mechanisms and uh, fora with the EU member states even well before the full membership. So we, for example, in the area of fight against uh, uh, disinformation, launched an initiative, of course, uh, there is always European Commission supporting us uh, in terms of strengthening all of our sectoral policies. But the, in this specific uh, case, there is uh, now an initiative with the European Digital Media Observatory, because we are interested in sharing 
in the learning processes and uh, uh, wherever there is a common challenge, because I see that uh, that this this information uh, it's 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 a European challenge. It's a challenge among EU member states, and we should definitely uh, participate in as many uh, fora and format as soon uh, as possible. So this is one of the possible instruments, maybe to tackle. Uh, challenges like this together, while also promoting the revised methodology of EU enlargement. And in particular, because, and this is maybe maybe even the most uh, uh, important uh, geopolitical moment to seize, so to say, that now in this wider, very complex geopolitical situation with the war in Ukraine, of course, that Montenegro being again, the most advanced can EU candidate country, of course, that we are not expecting any shortcuts or uh, uh, a fast track uh, membership uh, uh, without merits, but we should definitely explore together with EU member states, together with the Commission, what are those tools, what are those new mechanisms that now might be elaborate, elaborated even, even more with the requests of Ukraine, of Moldova, of, of Georgia, how maybe to enhance the amount of, of EU funds available or its easier distribution among, among uh, candidate countries or those who are going to become uh, uh, these. But uh, uh, as well with this early integration measures of being observers, being having seat in some uh, EU formats with EU member states even well before the full the full mem membership. And just to maybe close up again, for Montenegro, uh, uh, it is very relevant to, to convey always this uh, geopolitical message that uh, we uh, have been uh, following and aligning our foreign policy with the common foreign and security policy, also as a NATO member. And we should seek even uh, among those EU-NATO uh, structures and formats more instruments to act on certain uh, challenges and issues, such as, for example, uh, this permanent uh, structure co cooperation, PESCO instrument, that might uh, allow for a closer cooperation between some EU member states and NATO uh, members. And this is something that we as the team as the negotiating team have been exploring and will be uh, will be coming up with the, with a proposal to our Ministry of Defence soon. So okay, thank it you. It is very important to 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 understand that we are now finding ourselves in Closing a in words, a very uh, complex geopolitical situation that is worth uh, making most of in order to further promote EU EU enlargement policy and of course membership to the EU. Thank you. Thank you very much, much uh, Ms. Kordic. Uh, I'll come back to you uh, in a minute, but in the meantime, let me ask uh, Mr. Jambaski. Uh, Mr. Jambaski, what's uh, your comment on, on, on the words of uh, Ms. Kordic? And uh, uh, what are the prospects of uh, Montenegro succession? Well, first of all, I want to thank to Mrs. Uh, Kordic uh, for her participation, uh, because um, uh, her insight is very important always inside view is a relevant one. Uh, it's very visible. Montenegro looks like uh, the foreigner in this negotiation process, having closed three of the negotiation chapters and opened all, all the others. So the internal reforms have clearly given a, a new, new energy to the process of the country's uh, accession to the European Union. So Montenegro made, uh, made a big step forward when the country aligned uh, its foreign policy to the uh, European Union, and, but not, also, not only, also with the NATO uh, membership. So really, Montenegro is on the right way. Thank you, Mr. Jambaski. Back to you, uh, Mrs. Kordic. Uh, um, according to the President uh, Milo Djukanovic, uh, the unsolved uh, uh, issues uh, uh, of the uh, breakup uh, of the former Yugoslavia are a good breeding ground uh, for the devastation and stagnation of the region's European integration in recent years. 
In addition, a few years ago, there was uh, an attempted coup uh, in Montenegro, and uh, there are allegations of uh, Russia being behind. How will you uh, estimate uh, the Russian influence in your country and uh, in the region as a whole? I can uh, only uh, emphasize and always agree what we have heard uh, before uh, during the discussion uh, that the whole of the Western uh, Balkans region is ge geopolitically very important for the overall stability and security of the whole of the European uh, continent. And why this is uh, always important whenever we talk about EU enlargement policy, we have to always emphasize that we are not just talking about uh, history or geography or a geographic space that needs to be uh, to, to have its uh, completion within its final pieces of puzzle whenever we talk about Western Balkans or Montenegro. But because it is really important to understand that that maybe during the 90s, we as the as the for, as a former uh, Yugoslav country and, and the individual Western Balkans countries haven't maybe uh, have uh, have uh, haven't uh, used the chance to promote the EU uh, and the accession to the EU as the peace project. So we haven't really, uh, as democracies, back then we maybe weren't back then uh, mature enough to focus focus around economic interests, to focus around things that connects, connect and uh, unite uh, people, but rather uh, opted for, for some um, uh, more dangerous political views that uh, eventually uh, brought this uh, very uh, painful leg legacy in the territory of the whole of the Western Balkans. And this is why, again, EU integration is so important as an instrument for Montenegro, but for all our countries to uh, protect this uh, overall uh, geopolitical space uh, in terms of uniting it around common interests. So this is why we also have regional instruments, uh, instruments of regional cooperation that, again, should all function uh, for uh, more accelerated EU accession. And in particular, because there have been, of course, uh, third countries' influences. You mentioned one example, but uh, uh, in particular, from the moment when Montenegro ad obtained uh, NATO uh, uh, membership, this has been a constant um, uh, uh, challenge in terms of uh, we simply... Uh, started sharing uh, the similar or same challenges as other uh, uh, NATO uh, members. And uh, not only political influence but uh, of third countries, but heavy economic influence. The Montenegrin economy has been uh, very uh, much uh, and overburdened by the by the Chinese loan, for example. And uh, so there are various uh, uh, layers and uh, elements uh, and, of course, tools. We can uh, put it also in the category of, of, uh, of hybrid strategies that uh, are actually subject of this, uh, of this type of uh, influence. But, again, it's a matter of principle and it's a matter of... Uh, uh, not only simply a pillar, one pillar of foreign policy of our small country. We are we are a small country, but we have uh, made our strategic choice in terms of what system of values do we belong, and this is clear. So even when the economic price is high, for example, for the continuous alignment with the common foreign and security policy, the economic price of restrictive measures towards Russia, and I'm not talking about the current situation, but uh, a couple of years or even 10 years backwards have been quite costly for Montenegrin tourist-oriented uh, economy. So again, to put aside historical and cultural ties uh, and so on, it has an, uh, a very heavy price tag 
on it. Uh, with the new package of restrictive measures that we are preparing now, this will be even the more uh, so. But again, when balancing between the belonging to the system of values and, again, uh, the impact to the economy, there is a clear uh, picture and clear choice in front of Montenegro, and we have been uh, and we have been firm uh, firm on this. Uh, Mr. Kordic, uh, Mr. Jabalski, do you have any comment on that? Well, not a comment. Maybe. Do you have something to add? Yes, maybe I would like to ask uh, uh, Mrs. Kordic um, um, a question about the foreign influence. Uh, and the question is as follows, uh, Mrs. Kordic, uh, uh, how will Co uh, Montenegro uh, tackle the uh, Serbian influence from one hand, organized by the Serbian state and the Serbian Orthodox Church? And on the other hand, uh, what can you do, what, do uh, what can you prepare against, the, for example, Chinese influence and their mega projects to build uh, mega structures, highways, if I'm not wrong, uh, there is a project to build a highway between the, the city of Bar uh, to, the, to the border, to the Albanian border, no, to so the Serbian border. Uh, so are these projects threat for the Montenegro from your point of view? Uh, again, I always uh, uh, underline that EU accession and EU integration framework is a proper umbrella to uh, to to have uh, an adequate response even on this type of challenges, which are of course very complex. Because whenever there is this uh, sensitive relationship with the, with with. Uh, with the church, with the, uh, in a, uh, whenever we talk about uh, religion issues, of course, that fundamental rights and uh, this specific uh, uh, corpus of rights uh, when it comes to uh, what our, our citizens' expectations need to be tackled very carefully. But at the same time, the tools, the analysis. So this is why it is important to, to always participate in the EU uh, and the NATO fora to actually learn how how to systemically recognize because it's really it's really challenging to uh, to fight this information given given the the easiness of its uh, of, of of the approach especially when it comes to the to the accessibility when it comes to the social networks and uh, so it's. It's, it is all, uh, always easier to spread uh, fake news and to and to instigate uh, uh, some um, uh, information than to uh, syst systemically and systematically uh, build uh, not only the institutional adequate institutional response but also but also skills. Uh, within our uh, administration, but also to have this uh, way of uh, uh, educating and, and uh, building more sensible approach uh, among, an, uh, among average citizens. That's why I always insist on instruments that are part of the EU integration process that may be now part of the, of the early integration measures so it is important to, to to see it also as a set of skills that need to be uh, that need to be acquired later on you will see how some of our think tanks our fact checkers are uh, trying to, to to help the society build this resilience but it's up to us to really make most of these processes and uh, this is why eu integration again is so important so that our institutions become become resilient when it comes to the to the uh, challenges related to the again uh, chinese uh, loan of course that uh, again we should find a proper balance and we have been having the discussions even during the last year with the commission on how to to use most of those uh, instruments that are 
that are available via Western Balkans uh, investment framework, other uh, ways of uh, using EU funds uh, via uh, European Investment Bank, other um, uh, uh, other banks under I IFIs, uh, just to uh, to to try to uh, to create a more uh, appropriate appropriate financial model model for, for, the, for the future. And I'm sure that only with the combination of these instruments, we can, uh, we can succeed. So definitely, uh, apart from um, uh, measures that have been taken during the last year from the government, directly uh, in relation to the, to, the, to, to the Chinese debt, there was the, the hedging uh, agreement. We, we switched finally from uh, dollar to euro debt. And so there were some advantages uh, related to the state uh, budget in this new uh, in this uh, new uh, arrangement. But beside that, if you want to build further and you ask whether we are going to proceed, of course, that when it comes to the in infrastructural projects, uh, Port of Bar needs to be part of the... So we, 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 we have to find uh, uh, also an economically sustainable way of... Uh, of, of uh, uh, completing this very, this very important infrastructural uh, project, but this will be definitely through uh, EU uh, instruments uh, available. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Gordic, uh, for your important and timely remarks. Uh, going back to Mr. Jambaski, if you, if you want something to add uh, on what uh, we have uh, just heard from uh, Ms. Kosic. Well, it it's visible. Montenegro is, uh, as I said, uh, a foreigner. Uh, they uh, have some issues to solve regarding the, the Serbian influence, of course. But historically, um, people in Montenegro, uh, they prove in the history that they, when they are convinced, uh, they can fight and they can... Uh, they can uh, uh, create their better future. Uh, obviously, they they make their choice, European way, and we need to support them. This is the the country with uh, uh, the most clear European way in the region, for sure. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jambaski, uh, Mrs. Kordic. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution to this uh, discussion. Um, to our audience. Uh, don't go away, stay with us. Uh, the expert discussion follows immediately after the short video presentation. For the next uh, one hour, we will have an interesting discussions with experts and practitioners in the field of security and disinformation. We have with us uh, in the studio uh, Ms. Domenica Kosic, Chosic, journalist, Polish uh, TV correspondent in Brussels, but also author of uh, books on, uh, on the Balkans. We have uh, Mr. Lars Patrick Burke, substitute member of the Foreign Committee uh, in the European Parliament. And remotely, we have with us uh, Mr. Drizan Shala, national security and inter-ethnic relations expert from Kosovo, who will take part uh, uh, in the discussion uh, from distance. And Mr. Milan Jovanovic, analyst in the Digital for Forensic uh, uh, Research Center in Montenegro. Welcome everybody to our discussion. Mr. Shala, first uh, uh, to you. Knowing the history of uh, uh, the region, we all know how tragic uh, the consequences of uh, ethnic hatred can be. Do you still see nowadays some, of, uh, some cases of uh, ethnic uh, discrimination of the Western Balkans uh, and uh, what are they? Is anybody trying to reinforce such tendencies uh, in the region? Good afternoon again from me and from my country, from Kosovo. 
let me start uh, with the first question about uh, if some potential in the region expect the in Kosovo between Kosovo and Serbs. I think during the time now, during the Ukraine war be, uh, between Russia and Ukraine, now we have some tension, some ethnical tension that now in the region because um, uh, even Serbians, even the ministers from uh, Serbian government are trying in different ways, in different f- uh, forms to increase the activities of the propaganda that uh, shows that uh, if the EU uh, memberships and if uh, if our government and uh, the Serbian government do not stop the activity uh, to find a solution to find a road to the, the tension between Serbia and Serbian to bring it to the dialogue to the process that we it's ongoing I think that uh, we it could be not far away that we will have a, a second 2004 Mars riots because in the, in the year 2004 we had some ethnical riots in Kosovo that uh, produced a lot of uh, consequences against the Serbs, against Albanians and so on. I think that now is the time that Brussels need to be more actively in this process and to find the solution through the dialogue and do not let them uh, on the declaration of the both sides because during this weekend we will have election in uh, in Serbia, that and the tension between Kosovo and Serbians are very high because our government decided that uh, the Serbian could not find or could not uh, managing or they can uh, the, they cannot organize the election in Kosovo. So it's forbidden from them to make on this such uh, uh, activity in Kosovo. So that means that uh, the potential between uh, the both countries and the ethnic groups inside the country is very high. And so for that issue, I think. If we are not carry on that issue, we will have the problems that it can be uh, riots and uh, this kind of riots can move through the other country that we have a, a neighbor country, Macedonian, that even there, the uh, Macedonian part and the Albanian part, they do not have uh, such good co- uh, cooperation and integration between each other. And the other part, you have also in uh, Montenegro, you have not a stability government. And so in this case, if something will happen in Kosovo, it will be uh, like a domino effect for other countries. And so in this, in this case. Now to our next guest, uh, Mr. Dominika Cosic, uh, uh, the Polish TV correspondent in uh, Brussels. Uh, who is also an author of uh, books on on the Balkans. Uh, Mr. Cosic, uh, um, as a journalist yourself, uh, uh, you know the influence uh, the media can have, uh, especially uh, in the region. So how do you estimate the state of media uh, in the Balkan region? And is there a problem of uh, disinformation, you see? Yes, there is uh, many thanks for invitation, first of all. I think that it is quite a big problem of this, for, this formation and we have seen this uh, for the first time uh, during the COVID pandemic. When it started, it was visible that uh, two bigger uh, global players, uh, I mean Russia and China, used this opportunity uh, to increase uh, their powers and influence on, uh, in, ba- in Balkans region, especially in Serbia, also in Montenegro, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Kosovo. And especially on the beginning, it was very visible that they are using propaganda, anti-EU, anti-Western, to show that uh, the only friends of uh, the region are China and uh, Russia, the, the, country, the only country who are distributing some help uh, to the people from the region. It was visible. Of course, EU didn't... Uh, uh, EU is not without a mistake. It was some mistakes on the side of the European Union, especially on the beginning. Uh, the real help of the European Union was, enough, was not enough strong to the regions. Uh, that's true. We have to, uh, to say this openly. And there, there was a delay. Of this it, was, it was a big delay. And this delay, this gap was used ex- excellent by China and by Russia. Because what they did, they started to tell to the people, to audience, using also media, that uh, you see, European use, uh, Union is useless, it's d- doing nothing for you, you are now helpless. And we are coming. And we are coming, we are, only your, uh, we are the only friends uh, who are distributing some help. And uh, later on, when the EU started to come with the help, it was uh, very useful, but it was some, uh, it was delayed, and uh, this PR was uh, already negative for the EU. And doesn't matter that it is the EU who is the biggest donors, of the vaccines, for example, in the region and uh, some medical stuff. 
still some people have in mind that uh, it was collapse of uh, it was a mistake of the European Union. It was fault of uh, European Union. It is one case. Another case that we are observing now when there is a war in Ukraine, and uh, there are bigger and smaller uh, cases of uh, disformation and uh, manipulation. Of course, it is Russia who is the leading player. Russia is using every single opportunity to show uh, that, uh, for example, people in Serbia are, are supporting Russia. Of course, there are some historic, uh, historical uh, connections between Serbia and uh, Russia. Uh, there are some political facts uh, from the recent history, like, uh, for example, attacks of NATO on Serbia and Montenegro in 1999, and later on in 2008, uh, independence of Kosovo, which was not uh, recognized by Russia, not, uh, also by five EU countries like Romania, for example, Greece, Cyprus, uh, Slovakia and uh, Spain. Spain, thank you. But also Russia. And Russia used this situation, now is using, to show to the peop uh, Serbian people, look, only Russia didn't pet betray you. So you should be grateful to Russia, to, you should show you're grateful to Russia. And uh, now in Belgrade, the, there are, we are observing uh, from distance, <laughs> I'm talking about me, uh, two kinds of manifestations. There are pro-Russian and pro-Ukrainians, but only those uh, who are pro-Russian, there are very, uh, very much presence in media. Uh, those who are supporting the Ukraine, the, they don't have such a big attention of media. And it is also using by Russia to show that uh, there are countries who are supporting Russia, even now when Russia is uh, behaving like a barbar towards Ukrainian people. And it was, I need to give you just a very small uh, example, but it shows this machine of propaganda. Uh, recently on Twitter, it was information, it was tweet of uh, some users from Germany, but I guess it, that it was a Russian troll who put the picture, it was a short film, video film, of um, people praying on the streets, men. And uh, he described this, that uh, Serbian men are praying for the victory of Russia. But in fact, it was a film taken, uh, took in Warsaw, and it was a rosary of men when Polish men were praying for the peace and the prosperity for Poland. So it was... Uh, Two lies, two lies in one film. It was not Serbian people praying for Russia, but Polish people, and not for Russia, but for Poland. But it was very, uh, it was distributed on Twitter, and it was many comments. And immediately, I was observing this. It was lots of retweets, lots of likes, and uh, it shows that it is. Uh, it was not single situation when someone used this, uh, some single user of Twitter, but it was all. Uh, it was part of bigger. A propaganda machine and of course I uh, wrote that it is fake news, sorry, but it is not Belgrade, it is Warsaw and uh, there are not Serbs, there are Polish and praying for Poland, <laughs> not for Russia. Uh, he blocked me of course, that's normal, but it shows how active is Russian propaganda, how much is using this situation to show that there are countries and people who are, who are still supporting Russia and uh, there are also some information sharing in Serbia in media that, for example, about the situation in eastern Ukraine, that the Ukraine's uh, uh, people were killing Russian people, Russian minority. And there are, uh, it is also very present in French media, by the way. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, they use every single situation and the media, some media who are more pro-Russian, of course, uh, they are sharing this information. So they are making this formation now. Is Serbia the country that uh, uh, has the stronger, the strongest uh, Russian influence within the Western Balkans, according to you, or there is another country that faces the same problem? If, of course, Serbia is the biggest country, so that's why it, it, the scale is also the biggest, but also we can observe this in Bosnia and Herzegovina, even in Croatia, which, are not so, which is not so pro-Russian as Serbia. Also in uh, Kosovo, uh, my colleague from Kosovo will tell about this, but uh, on the smaller scale. I think that it is uh, very present in all uh, Western Balkans countries, but the most uh, present it is in Serbia because it is a traditional alliance.
for Russia and it is also orthodox country like Russia. So Russia is using, using this stereotype to show that uh, Serbia is a friend of Russia and uh, Serbia should be grateful to Russia. And uh, now we have uh, many visits of Russian politicians to Serbia who, who want also to use this situation uh, to show that uh, Serbia is even... Uh, should do something for Russia to show uh, loyalty towards Russia. Now let's go uh, to the ECR MEP uh, Lars Patrick Burke, uh, who is a sub substitute member of the European Parliament Committee on Foreign Affairs. Uh, Mr. Burke, uh, you, you've just uh, heard uh, the problems the Western uh, Balkan countries are facing uh, uh, in the path of uh, their European integration. Uh, what should be uh, the European Union reaction on, on that? Well, firstly, let me uh, state that nothing is like before 24th of February 2022. Mm. The Russian, Russian invasion uh, in Ukraine has had an extensive impact on security in the Western Balkans and, of course, uh, in regards to Europe. And uh, my deep conviction is that the European Union has turned a blind eye far too long in regards to the region and all the countries uh, that are involved. So currently, what are we seeing? We are seeing narratives, new narratives, Russian narratives that are um, comparing the Serbian dominated north of Kosovo with uh, the separatist regions in Ukraine, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk and a comparison of NATO intervention in Kosovo in regards to Crimea and South Ossetia and Abkhazia. We are experiencing, we are seeing a uh, heavy engagement of uh, Russian companies in Serbia. Uh, media outlets, the uh, Sputnik media outlet is uh, in Belgrade. We have uh, Luk Oil, Gazprom, uh, Rosneft, etc., heavily engaged in, in Serbia. And if we, the European Union, continues to turn a blind eye on all these activities, well, per se, economic engagement isn't bad, but taking into account this aggression in regards to Ukraine, we have to take it very serious. Otherwise, we might wake up uh, after having a very bad nightmare. And therefore, and uh, please allow me to um, focus uh, on Kosovo. Um, Kosovo has, is one of the youngest countries in Europe. And therefore, I think it is very important in regards to Kosovo, for example, to uh, give the people and the government the opportunity for a fast speed accession to the European Union, maybe even to NATO and for the young generation, the young people, to have a future perspective uh, to really uh, get back into talks in regards to visa liberalisation. And this is to the good for the security of the European Union and for the overall region of the Western Balkans. Mm. Thank you. Um, we are now going uh, to uh, Mr. Milon Jovanovic. Uh, who is with us uh, remotely. He's analyst in the Digital Forensic uh, Research Center in uh, Montenegro. Uh, Mr. Ivanovic, uh, are you with us? Yes. Uh, yeah. we, we have already mentioned uh, this information is uh, one of the biggest challenges uh, uh, for the Western Balkans. Uh, and uh, this information is uh, an example of uh, foreign interference of uh, the region. What other examples uh, of foreign interference uh, uh, would you like to mention? And uh, uh, how do the countries like uh, Montenegro fight against uh, uh, these uh, dangerous tendencies? Uh, good morning from, or good afternoon actually from Podgorica. First of all, I would like to thank the ECR group for this initiative and to salute my distinguished co-panelists. I hope we can make a productive panel today. So just as you put it, this information is just one of the examples of foreign interference. But when discussing it, I guess there is plenty to say, especially on the mentioned Russian activities in the Western Balkans. 
I come from a country where Russia plays a high role and for the last few years, so I guess I'm qualified to talk to talk about it. So increased intensity of Russian influence in Montenegro, particularly, came to the forefront after the invitation to join NATO in 2015 and was noticeable through 2016 through the activities of certain political parties, NGOs, media, civic activists and individuals whose, I would say, political and ideological concept is based on a change of Montenegrin strategic course from west to the east. And since then, all of the Moscow's moves have been aimed to increase divisions among citizens, to expand. There is an interruption of the connection. Uh, can we try to, to make it uh, better? Uh, okay, uh, we'll come back uh, uh, to our speaker uh, maybe in a minute or two. Uh, but uh, back to you, uh, Mr. Jambaski. Do you have any comment on, on what you've just heard? Well, there is nothing to add. Uh, we discussed this in our previous uh, panel and um, we are very much on the same on the same page here yes there is a disinformation yes uh, there are a number of uh, uh, fake news factories on the balkans mm -hmm. uh, mainly operated and controlled by the uh, groups um, of uh, political alliances uh, close to belgrade and uh, inspired from from kremlin from russia uh, and they will do their best to use these weapons against the Western Balkan countries and uh, uh, all the future uh, negotiation processes are uh, under this threat. As a shadow rapporteur on North Macedonia, do you see any uh, disinformation uh, uh, campaigns uh, starting from Moscow going through Belgrade and uh, uh, accessing uh, uh, Macedonia? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, for example, uh, the President Putin himself is the master, uh, the, 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 the main master of creating a fake news. Uh, he was uh, um, uh, a person um, who used fake news a number of times. For example, greeting a former president of the uh, Republic of North of Macedonia, Mr. Ivanov, um, greeting him um, about uh, the degrading of uh, our alphabet. Uh, because the 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 the, the Syri uh, Cyrillic Met alphabet, yes, the Bulgarian Cyrillic, one, yes. pretended uh, to be Macedonian one. Yes, created by the Macedonian state, a uh, number of decades uh, before the, the the very existence of this state. So, Mr. Putin, a, a number of times, uh, greeted the, uh, the, the 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 ruling circles in in Skopje uh, with this fake news. So. Uh, there is this line, the, the line is very visible. And for example, the main anti-European, anti-Western, anti-Bulgarian rhetoric in the region is created by these uh, Russian troll fabrics based on uh, uh, on the ground. But is it a Republic new line or uh, it's a line started in the past uh, from Comintern times? Yes, this line was uh, uh, the, the, the beginning of this line uh, is back in 1933 in Kremlin. Uh, when uh, so-called communist international organization they decide to create a number of nations uh, in order to divide um, uh, nations on the balkans uh, on their uh, purposes to create uh, the world revolution world bolshevik revolution so they create a number of nations a number of minorities uh, and so far from 1933 uh, till Nowadays, uh, this process uh, never stopped. Uh, he was very. Uh, this process was very, uh, very active during the uh, the Bolshevik times in Yugoslavia. Uh, dictatorship of Tito um, was the um, the front runner of this process. Uh, they create a number of fake uh, history, um, f historical myths, very active today. Uh, they create a f uh, they create a number of hate speech myths, of uh, hate speech logos, of hate speech uh, meme, and they use this uh, uh, up to 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 nowadays. 
is it an obstacle uh, of the uh, North Macedonian uh, uh, accession to the European Union? And how big is it? Well, they, an obstacle. Yes, they will try uh, to uh, to use both processes. If there is a process, they will use the process to to blow it from inside. Mm -hmm. If there is no process, they will say yes, Bulgarians are guilty. The guilt is uh, uh, in in Sofia. As for them, they try to to create win-win situation for Kremlin and Belgrade. Mm. Uh, back to Mr. Jovanovic. Uh, we we have him in in the video connection. Mr. Jovanovic, can you hear us? Yeah, and I okay. hope this time the connection won't be that bad. We hope so. Um, uh, we were yeah, uh, speaking. Uh, you were talking about the Russia interference interference in uh, Montenegro. Exactly, and the set of tools from the I would say scope of the Russian power in Montenegro is very extensive and it includes several different spheres. We talked about this information, but there is so much more to it. You have these media narratives, you have these cyber attacks, continued use of the religion. They weaponize the religion using the Serbian Orthodox Church as a soft power tool. And the, I guess they support also the ultra-right pro-Russian conservative parties, media, organizations. And the Moscow's presence in Montenegro became even more visible after the failed coup in 2016, as well as Montenegro's entry to, into NATO the following, the following year. Uh, as a special actor facilitating foreign influence, uh, I guess I would single out the church, whose position is always harmonized and aligned with the Russian Orthodox Church and the Kremlin, and which was continuously for years involved in anti-NATO, anti-Western rallies, protests, demonstrations, and with 2020 parliamentary and local elections. In the light of the Russian invasion, the Serbian Orthodox Church in Montenegro has sided with the Russians. They sided with the Russian Orthodox Church and they are not shy to show it, you know. So the influence of the church in Montenegro is very strong, which was shown during the elections in 2020, when the church had not only had its favorite, I mean, the party or the candidate, but the church also handpicked the current prime minister in Montenegro. So the change of the government in 2020 paved the way for the Russian Malay influence as the biggest constituent of the new majority is pro-Russian party, Democratic Front, which was accused of having part in coup attempt in 2016. And at this very moment, we have the head of the parliament and the minister of defense who are actors, I would say, whose activities are in significant discrepancy with the proclaimed European and Euro-Atlantic principles. Uh, at the current stage, Montenegro, without the functional institutions, is open to direct Russian influence, and not just political, but the influence on many other aspects via its proxies that cover important political position in my country. And in this regard, after the Russian aggression in Ukraine, uh, the Montenegrin government has not yet adopted the sanctions against Russia, he has not yet sided with the EU and the Western partners, where it belongs, of course, so we cannot talk much about an effective fight by the institutions at this very moment. And Montenegro is currently in the process of forming a new minority government, since no confidence vote was passed mid-February this year. And I guess I would finish with this in order to prevent malign influence and negative scenarios, it is really of high importance that this new government has to be pro-European, pro-NATO and pro-Western, where there will be no room from pro-Russian elements like now and which will not block Montenegrin European path. And of course, which will be able to fulfill obligations coming from the NATO membership. And that's it for me. For now, but moment, we can discuss it but further. Stay, yeah, but stay with us, please. Uh, we are trying to renew our video connection with uh, Mr. Drijan Shala from Kosovo, uh, and uh, we, we will uh, uh, give him uh, the floor uh, after we renew the connection. But in, but uh, in the meantime, uh, uh, let's hear from uh, all of you. Uh, what is uh, uh, the uh, general impact all these uh, threats uh, can have uh, uh, on the Western Balkan region. Mr. Burke, back to you. Well, 
the impact is of uh, is a very malign, uh, bad impact, and um, it would be a tragedy if uh, this impact would set fire to the powder keg of the Western Balkans or the Balkans uh, overall. So Brussels needs to be aware that something is uh, something uh, needs to be done now to stabilize the region, to get more engaged and to give the people, especially the young people, a uh, perspective for the future. Ms. Josic. Yes, I, I agree that the situation might be very difficult um, in Kosovo, but also in Bosnia and Herzegovina, especially with Republika Serbska. We are see, uh, observing now a more and more difficult situation. Russia is, of course, using situation, but um, I will say something maybe not popular. Uh, Serbs who are living in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and, but also Croats, they have reason to be concerned because they've, uh, by many years, they felt like a second ca class cate uh, category, category. Uh, citizens comparing with uh, Muslim uh, Bosnians. And uh, Russia is using this. Uh, Russia is using uh, uh, this uh, negative emotions between Serbs people, which has who has right to feel like this, and Croats uh, share the same. And, uh, but Russia is using uh, not to help to these people, of course, but to destroy a uh, peaceful process and to, uh, to de destabilize the situation in Western Balkans. Because w if we will start to talk again about borders in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Republika Serbska, it will open Pandora box and it might open a new war conflict because, uh, you know, if uh, Balkans mentality also, and the very difficult history. Every single discussion about changing of borders is very difficult and might uh, lead to new conflict. So it is very dangerous and Russia is playing, using all her instruments to make the situation even more dangerous. Mr. Ivanovic, what could be the impact for the whole of region? Uh, well, the alienation of the EU and the United States from the Western Balkans in the last year, which of course occurred to the range of many internal issues, paved the way for in space for activities uh, or actors trying to destabilize the Balkans. But I guess even though Russia is you know, trying to be present here, I don't see Russia has a sophisticated approach or any long-term strategy that would, you know, make Russia more approachable to the Western Balkan countries than the EU. Uh, Moscow, as of course, tries to obstruct the entire West's efforts in the Western Balkans by using all kinds of different soft power mechanisms, which I talked about. And it's not just in Montenegro, it's the same in all the countries, just the approach is a little bit different. Uh, I would say that ultimately, Russia, Moscow, or doing the, doing the work via its proxies, cannot, you know, replace the process of Euro-Atlantic and European integrations. It can only slow it down. But I would finish with the urge to Brussels that Brussels really need to be aware of what's happening here, because for far too long, Brussels has been turning the blind eye towards Russian proxies and Russia direct influence in the Western Balkan countries and Serbia as the main and the key partner of Russia in the Western Balkans. And Brussels needs to step in and to stabilize the region to help not only Montenegro to finish its negotiating process. Even though we are front runner, we have still a lot of things to do, but so do the other countries. So I would hope someone from Brussels can hear this. So uh, is this uh, the only thing that uh, Brussels can do or uh, there is uh, something more to add? I mean, after a, after a long time, Brussels has recognized the Serbian Orthodox Church, even though they said Orthodox Church in the Western Balkans as a partner or, or a proxy of Russian influence. But this story is not new. It's old five or five, five to five years. But someone in Brussels didn't want to hear it. And now when it's, I guess, too late, Brussels steps in and says it. So they need to be much more proactive and in terms of helping out the European integrations of the Western Balkan countries and be more present. This, this is the way that, that I see it. Uh, okay, uh, are these, uh, are these uh, all these uh, tendencies, are, uh, are they warning uh, for the region uh, or uh, there are uh, an attempt to, to discredit these uh, six countries in, in the eyes of uh, the European Union? Ms. Josic. 
I, uh, yes, that's very obvious that, uh, for, for example, now the situation in Serbia is using against the uh, Serbian accession process. Uh, I mentioned uh, those manifestations who are supporting, who shows express uh, support for Russia, which are taking uh, part, unfortunately, in uh, Belgrade, but they are intentionally by Russia, organizing by Russians, mm -hmm. and there are, uh, there is, uh, Russia is uh, keeping hand to, 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 be sh uh, to be sure that uh, those manifestations will be very present in Western media. Because uh, why Russia is doing this? Because Russia would, wants to show that uh, Serbia, uh, the, that moods in Serbia are anti-European, pro-Russian, and uh, because Russia hopes that thanks of this, uh, we'll close the door to the Serbian ex accession. But and unfortunately, I have to confess that uh, after many of the manifestations pro-Russian, I heard many voices from Brussels, from Paris, from Poland as well, that. Uh, Serbian people are not ready to join to the EU because they choose the Russian side. They, are, they prefer to be on the Russia, Russian side than on the European side. And uh, it shows how successful, unfortunately, for the moment is Russia. It is one of the goals of Russia to show that Serbia is anti-European, anti-Ukraine, anti-European, and uh, then it will, uh, this process of uh, accession of Serbia to the EU will be slower and maybe it will be, it will, it will be not continuing even. Do, do some of these uh, six countries try to, to, fight, to fight against uh, uh, this disinformation uh, processes? Some of them, uh, yes, even in Serbia you have some politicians, you have some academics and people, even the media who are uh, fighting with this process. They are, very aware that uh, what's going on and what is uh, playing Russia, but they need uh, to have uh, stronger support from the EU, because uh, when they will be uh, left alone, they will be not enough strong to fight with this. They need some money, some instruments from the EU, how to fight with this, uh, this information from Russia side. Mr. Jambaski, uh, how did the war in Ukraine uh, uh, change the, the situation with uh, disinformation in the six uh, Western Balkan countries? Simply make it worse. Um, it was worse, but now it's even. Um, this is, as all the people here said, uh, this is some kind of second front. Mm -hmm. Front of disinformation and uh, attempt to to split the attention and as, as uh, uh, my colleagues here um, explained from their point of view uh, how uh, all the tools are are used the church the public opinion the cultural and historical heritage and russia will not be shy to use all its pro proxies here and yes they will try to do something in bosnia herzegovina for sure using uh, people like uh, Dodic, like mm -hmm. Vucic, like uh, Dacic, all of them, um, they pretend to, to, to represent different sides of different societies, but what united them is their, their uh, dream for the greater and greater Serbia. And um, we should not underestimate this Serbian attempt to to rebuild some kind of uh, their own empire on the Balkans, mm. uh, using uh, Yugoslavian heritage, using uh, um, Tito myth and a lot of a lot of uh, from uh, of these tools. Yes, uh, there is a risk to to create a new conflict in Bosnia Herzegovina because there are reasons for Croats to to be a little bit angry uh, within the federation. And we need to um, to back them in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, there are uh, signals that something is going on in uh, in Kosovo, uh, in these uh, six uh, uh, communities united by Serbska list uh, uh, political formation. Uh, so um, Ukraine will give to these guys Dodic, Vucic, Dacic. Uh, give them more power to try to do something here on the Balkans. 
A very short answer, one additional question, uh, Mr. Jambaski. Uh, what will be uh, the impact uh, on the European Union integration process uh, of Serbia? The impact of all these tendencies you just described? Bet. You so the, 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 the process will be slowed down? or? I, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think so. Mr. Josic, there is you a, think so? Uh, bo both sides uh, anger. Mm -hmm. Yes, I fully agree. Unfortunately, the, it will, uh, the process will be, slow, will be slowed down because uh, uh, Serbia is now presenting as a country who is officially supporting Russia and uh, there is choice. Either you are supporting Russia, either you are supporting European U Ukraine and European Union. And if uh, Serbia will decide to uh, keep out from the sanction, putting sanction on Russia, uh, Russia is asking for this, uh, it will uh, make uh, the uh, European integration for Serbia even more difficult than before. Mr. Burke, your final remarks? Well, this is very important, uh, what uh, was just mentioned uh, in regards to Serbia. I think it's very, it would be crucial to keep up a line of communication. Um, and uh, especially, I'm constantly repeating myself in regards to the plight of the young generation. Um, but I think it's time for straight talk and uh, straight talk means speaking to the Serbian government as the European Union and saying you can't just have our money to purchase weapons from third parties. Then you need to implement reforms, uh, rule of law, democracy, and then we can go further on. But otherwise uh, there'll be a cut of ties. Mm. Mr. Ivanovic, uh, your final remarks uh, and uh, if, uh, if you could uh, allow me, we all know what, uh, what uh, are benefits uh, from uh, the European membership for the countries, uh, but what could be uh, the, the benefit from the Western Balkan countries uh, uh, to the U European Union and to the future of Europe? Uh, well, I would first jump in on something that was mentioned during the panel. And just to add that Russian, Russia's aggression on Ukraine has, of course, caused a dramatic change in how West approached Russia. And also it paved the way, as I see it, for the new world order. This special military operation, as they like to call it in the Kremlin, has not get this outline of Blitzkrieg. And also what it produced is uh, the support, increased support of NATO. But not just that, it gave a new uh, NATO a new raison d'etre. As you, could, as you could call it that, this way. So what would, just to jump in and try to answer your question, what would be the benefits of Western Balkans joining the EU? As you see, the Western Balkans have been a soft spot of Europe. And for years, it have been place where East and the West collide. This way, just as was done with Montenegrin's uh, adoption to NATO, I guess it could be done the same and this whole Russian, Russian aggression of Ukraine could facilitate the whole process and this way European Union could close its circle in one of the most soft spots in Europe, in the Western Balkans. This way that would be a confirmation that the EU is still active, that would be a confirmation of the significance of the enlargement process and it would be a confirmation that the EU is here, is here to help and to help all the citizens of the Western Balkans. And it would send a strong message to the East, to Moscow and to all of other proxies of Russia that EU is still alive and is still kicking in spite of their narratives that EU is weak and divided. So I think this would be the biggest you know, benefit of the Western Balkan countries, the six countries actually joining the EU. Much, uh, uh, to all of you, many thanks, uh, Mr. Ivanovic, Mr. Burke, uh, Ms. Chosic, and uh, Mr. Jambaski. Before we finish our discussion today, allow me to to, to come back uh, uh, to Mr. Jambaski for uh, uh, for final words, uh, uh, closing the the discussion in this panel. Well, uh, the history of um, 20th century began on, uh, if I'm not wrong, 28th of June 1914 in Sarajevo and ended uh, from 1992 to 1996 again in Sarajevo with the siege of Sarajevo. The region of Western Balkans has his crucial place and crucial role 
and played a crucial role in almost every uh, major historical act in the world of the 20th century. So uh, it's up to us not to allow 21st century to begin with the siege of Kiev and to end again uh, with the same. So Western Balkans, uh, they, they must be part of European Union. As I said, not at all cost. As I said, under the uh, whole criteria, Copenhagen and all other criteria, without any bilateral open um, questions and vision, uh, issues between the states. And uh, with the major decision that uh, good neighborly policy uh, should be fulfilled fully um, before, before uh, accessing. This, oh, yes, this process is uh, to start and of course to end uh, and to finish uh, successfully. That's it. Thank you very much uh, indeed. Uh, uh, this was our uh, first uh, panel discussion uh, and the second panel discussion. EU enlargement process uh, is an opportunity to counter the challenges in the Western Balkan will take place uh, tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. So uh, join us tomorrow morning. See you then. The ECR Group is the voice of Eurorealism, the sensible middle way between ever more Europe and no Europe, with respect for the sovereignty of Europe's national democracies, with less bureaucracy, more fiscal responsibility, and equality for all member states. We believe the peoples of Europe want the European Union to do less and to do it better, to promote economic recovery and growth and more jobs, to help not hinder our countries in getting immigration under control, to deliver a clean environment at a cost we can afford, to work with global partners to protect our security, to create jobs through free and fair trade. Europe should only act where it can deliver real added value to member states and their citizens. By putting Europe's national democracies back in the driving seat, we can build a Europe that will offer our countries a platform for cooperation that will help promote European prosperity and security for generations to come.